Now, our next speaker is Don Watson. And just to tell you about Don, he's an architect. He worked with the National Trust, the University of Queensland and the Department of Public Works. He and Judith Mackay authored um, a directory of Queensland architects to 1940 and Queensland architects of the 19th century. As the John Oxley Library Fellow in 2013, he commenced work on a successive volume to cover the period 1900 to 1950. He's very busy and he's going to give us the architect's perspective on all of this. Thank you, Don. I don't know how you all feel. We're already kind of finished 10 minutes ago or whatever, but um, and I'll probably go for maybe half an hour, 25 minutes. Um, and really, I feel it's a slight letdown following the sort of three most knowledgeable people in this field in Brisbane. What can I add? And the answer is a good deal less than's already been said. Um, but um, um, if you want to sit, stay here for a while, I'll, I'll flash quickly through... Um, what I was going to say, one of the things I want to say is I work for the National Trust and if any of you are searching the library catalogue, I, I'm working on a study of the Queensland House and the findings were came out in a report but it's not really useful in terms of this investigation. But while I was at the Trust, I, I did write so a couple of, two of three art, intended articles on dating houses. This is in 1974-5. Um, after I left the Trust, I put that out as a book, unbeknownst to me, it's under my name, but it lacked the third article and really it, it's much less helpful than it should have been and don't waste your time looking at it. Um, <laughs> and, and the council um, guide that um, Carmel mentioned is an altogether better starting point and you, you know so much more already today, um, so ignore the work that I did at the, at the Trust. But while I was at the Trust, and, and what I'll say, I mean, a lot of what's been said has been um, enormously detailed and much more detailed than I normally use although um, Stephanie finished where I would start saying the title search is absolutely essential and whenever I'm investigating any house, I do the title search. That is an absolutely basic thing. I, I ran into one of the um, volunteers today and she knows very clearly the history of her house and so in, um, it's only had two owners and stories like that. So that in particular cases, you may not think it's worth doing, but in almost every case, even where you think you know the history, the title search is still useful to do. Um, um, Carmel and Stephanie thought I should talk about specifically about things like architectural plans and Stephanie mentioned in more detail than I'm going to the locations and things of these repositories. Personally I don't look for, I, I don't hope to find a plan of the house I'm looking at and I, I don't remember now whether Derrington survives in the Truern collection at Friar or not. No it doesn't. That's the, and that's the reality. Very, all, very, very few private, private dwellings survive in repositories of architectural drawings. The number of drawings is increasing really enormously. So, I mean, Fry have 22,000 odd now, and the State Library are collecting at, at a considerable rate. And the Friar searchable map, it makes it very easy. So, you can now check if you want to if by some chance they might have your drawing in, two, in a minute or two, you can check whether there is a drawing in their collections. But almost never will there be one, and I don't spend time look, even looking, which is a bit shameful because I'm primarily interested in architects and architects' biographies. Um, but the work I'm doing really doesn't involve dating individual houses. I just don't have the time to do that. Um, the top left illustration there is, is, is from um, a book called, a little booklet, a catalog, an exhibition catalogue called Well Made Plans. One of the problems with architectural drawings is I'm so familiar with the conventions that are involved in them that I, I no longer have an understanding of what non-professional people see when they look at an architectural drawing. I mean, it's perfectly clear to me what the conventions are, what it all means. But I think mo a lot of people looking at it may not have that, uh, or certainly won't have the complete understanding and well-made plans that this catalogue in 1988 attempted to give a background to what architectural drawings are. So it explains the conventions, the type of, the, the stages in which a particular job might go in, through in an architect's office, um, how they're reproduced, and, 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 how, how, and how, how the building is, is represented. The colours of the drawings, and a lot of them are coloured, are symbolic of the materials in the building. So that is a, a clue to what it's being made out of and was an important part of tendering and building. The one on the right um, is a drawing from the collection here. It's for a house that was proposed for Auckland Flower, designed by Hall and Dodds, 
not built, um, a house by CW Chambers was preferred by the, the client and, and that, was, that was built instead. Um, um, and the, the colours there, when I was looking at it, I thought, oh my God, the drawing's been uh, excessively cleaned. And I don't think that may not be the case. Often these are linen drawings and the colours are painted on the back of the drawing and so they don't come out as strongly. But they're rather faded versions of what the actual colours are. But they're all like, some of those colours are listed in that Friar catalogue. It's online, so you can load it down if you're interested. Um, uh, Carmel's mentioned the problem of style and has come up a few times. I steer very cl mostly clear from style. I don't think it's very informative or helpful. Um, or it's not, it's not particularly to me. I'm, I'm interested in it, but it, it's, not a, it's not a primary concern. These, are, these, are these illustrations are all taken from a, the book in the, this bottom corner. It's the 150 Years of Brisbane River Houses. It's not such a terrible book. Um, but I can, and I, I want to talk first about the two images at the top. And it's held up as a, as a good example of Spanish mission style from the 1920s. And I can tell you with great authority that it has nothing to do with the 1920s and has nothing to do with Spanish mission because I designed it in 1985. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so <laughs> Um, anyway, and the same applies in a way to the, the illustrations at the bottom left. The one in the bottom left is supposed to be 1944. Well, it's terribly hard to see in that image what is 1944. The title, a search of the title would start giving you some basis on which to maybe interpret what might be 1944 about that. The one in the middle on the bottom um, is, is, is no doubt reliably dated here. It's 1987 or something like that. And it just shows, but it could have been a house of 100 years or 120 years earlier. It's not, it, I don't find starting with style anyway useful and if, unfortunately you can pick up quite often say the beginning introduction of a, of a kind of new style sometimes like California bungalow now it's easy with trove that's been mentioned a lot. You can put in the term of a style and do a search and you can, pick, you know, you can set earliest to see where you want the, the, um, the hits to be listed and so you can quite quickly uh, construct a a kind of maybe a history of the introduction of that style. But as Carmel and other people have said, people keep doing these things indefinitely. But unfortunately, a lot of authorities and, and quite eminent ones do put a date range and people believe in them and it's silly. Uh, it, it's not helpful. So, I mean, I steer clear of that. Um, what I'm more interested in, I just put in a couple of slides about a sort of a technical innovations and my trust port was much more interested in those sort of changes than in stylistic changes. And um, so I did a lot of work on outside studying, which is the, the name for the constructional term on the, in the bottom. And that's where the frame of the building is exposed on the outside of the building. And I was pretty sure, I worked very hard to try and work out when it was introduced in Queensland and identify these schools. This isn't the very first, this was a year later. This is 1867 up at Alora. And these are absolutely remarkable buildings, I might say. But the earliest ones are the year before in Brisbane in 1866. And I was pretty sure I'd done lots of work on, on this and was very proud of the, just finding all this stuff. And then 20 years later, Margaret Strello, who some of you might know, who's the mayor of Rockhampton, got onto me and said, I've got a house a year earlier than you say this style was done. <laughs> and I knew she was right. The minute she rang and said, cause I knew because I had guessed that this building might have been earlier but I was never able to find a photograph or a plan of it, the plans have, and the house has been moved, so it's no longer in the site where it was originally built anyway. But Margaret Strello is a very diligent house historian, and so she worked very hard on it. It's her own house, and that's a good reason, I think, for people to go into the detail that's been talked about today. And it's not detail that, as I say, that I normally embark on. But anyway, she was, she was right about this, and um, I then had to revamp my story to explain how this could have happened. And um, it's, a, it's a case of convergent evolution, is that right? Convergent evolution, <laughs> where you get uh, from, from the different sources, you arrive at the same answer. The ones in Rockhampton are German, R.H.O. Rorick, a German architect up there, and the ones on the bottom are R.G. Souter, a Brisbane architect, or English trained at Brisbane. But anyway, um, anyway, what I proposed, I, I thought a certain amount of recapitulation might be useful, although you're probably sick of it, but at least it won't be about Derrington, so <laughs> it'll be a different house. Um, <laughs> But um, in any case, it's about my own house, so that, that story about self-interest is, is very much to the core. When I was at the National Trust, um, or before, before I went to the Trust, I, I sort of worked out a way of dating houses, which was a bit ahead of most people. There wasn't much of it being done in that time. And so I dated, and then uh, I dated it again more recently. But I'm going to start with 1974. Um, um, after the Brisbane flood, um, um, I, I, this house was advertised for sale for the land value only. 
And I, I, I then bought it at the auction, and the illustration on the right is his sale, and me very thin in the middle, <laughs> but with Rex Addison in profile on the right, and the photograph was taken by Robert Riddell, another Brisbane architect who was interested in the house. Um, the thing about the house that was interesting is that it was made out of mud bricks, and that's its great claim to fame. That, that, that is pretty unusual. And so when, when visitors came to look at it at the time I bought it, and very knowledgeable people, including, say, Miles Lewis, who's a world authority on this construction, he claimed it was clay lump was the technique, an East Anglian technique. But Miles was big noting himself to me that day, I think, because it's not that anyway, it's not East Anglian. Um, but also I think it's not, it's, as far as I can see, and I'm not an expert on it, it's no different to mud brick or adobe or other terms um, are, are applied to it. But anyway, they came up with various suggestions of what the date of the house might be, and they were, they were quite early. They thought it might have been around even around separation, so 1859. So I was interested in trying to do it. When I settled on the property, I, was get a, I got a copy of the title, similar to the, do, the same as the documents you've seen, and I could see on that what's been observed. That it, it told you a story of the uh, limited part of the land ownership uh, of, of certain years. So this covers the period from 1960. This is the current title, by the way. Not the one I received when I settled, but one that's been updated to, to be converted to that real property, um, uh, the lot 67 on RP 11691, that, which happened in 1986, a few years later, as, um, as um, Kay has described. But I could also see that it had the previous titles, um, uh, the titles that preceded. So I could see that if you amalgamated those together, you got that sequence that Kay's talked about. Um, a friend in the li uh, not in this library, but at the uh, actually Bikes and Fryer Library at the University of Queensland in 1974, said to me that I ever heard of the post office directories, which at that stage I'd never heard of, and she sent me this an illustration of this page on the left, which is the directory from 1883 for, for Brook Street, South Brisbane, and it lists the residents in sequence from Stevens Road to Gladstone Road. You may be able to make that out, and then included in that. On, it's on the left and right side, but sometimes it's north and south, it's right away. But in about the position of where our house is, there's an entry for James Leo, a bricklayer, and that seemed a possibility. Um, um, what I... I oh, the, yes, these are the... Um, uh, jumping back two titles, this isn't the preceding one, it's the one before that, and you can see that a Joseph Leo acquired the property... Um, in, in, uh, in, in 1882, uh, just a year or so ahead of those directories. So it looked reasonably convincing evidence that, um, that he may have been the builder. And Kay mentioned mortgages, that there's no information on the titles about Im improvements to the property, um, but mortgages are a bit of a clue, I find. And, um, I mean, if you're looking for where things that don't work, then it's easy to say, oh, there, there are lots of explanations. But... As a general rule of thumb, if you look at a mortgage, and if the mortgage is taken out at the date of settlement, then it's a reasonable chance that there, the property is improved. If it's taken out a year or two later or whenever, and they, they borrow money, then that's a kind of clue that maybe they're borrowing money to improve the property. So that there are clues there, but I mean, it can be complicated because maybe there was already a house there and they're borrowing money to extend it or something like that. So there are lots of complications and it's doing the work and becoming a bit familiar with it that, um, that helps you use the data and, um, and, and come to re what are reasonable answers. Um, yeah, see, he takes no mortgage out and no mortgage there. But so I use that partly as a thinking of the that was the day. Anyway, the the telephone directories have have not been specifically mentioned, I don't think, but electoral rolls and other. But telephone directories are enormously useful. And in 1974, because Leo is an unusual name, like if it was Smith, I wouldn't bother. But L I H O U was sufficiently uncommon to think it's worth checking if there are any descendants. And of course there were, and within one or two phone calls I was speaking to the daughter of the person who claimed to build the house. And this is her uncle, um, James Leo, at a second house, two, they came to visit, she came to visit the house with other relatives, and they said, yes, he built the house. Oh, sorry, her father, Joseph Leo, with her uncle James, built the house, two brothers. And this is a photo of James at a second house, he built two doors up, number 35, that was also adobe. Um, and this is a photo of Joseph Leo. Um, so I was pretty confident, 
and that. And then when I was at the trust, we were quick, quick and dirty dating, if you like. Um, we were trying to get through a whole stack of dating to try and get a general understanding of the evolution of the form of Queensland houses. And so if we got into complex complications we couldn't deal with, we went to the next one. So we did a whole, we did a whole lot. So I've done lots of dating, but not in the detail that's been talked about today. And the sources are much greater than, than I use. And it, I've learned something. I think Stephanie should give me a bill for turning up and not paying a, a fee. Um, <laughs> But anyway, in the last few... Oh, sorry. Well, I, didn't, I hadn't looked at these field surveyors' books until quite recently. And these are... This is uh, my house here, and this is number 35. I was surprised. I'd only seen that photograph and assumed it was probably near the front of the block, but it's right near the back of the block. And that makes a lot of sense because the land's sloping up quite steeply here. And putting it up here, he gets a great view into town. So it was quite a smart move in a way. And then when the house was replaced, which it has been since... They built the house in front of it, which was quite convenient. They knocked the one over behind, and there's still a flat platform behind the, the new house. So it kind of explains that what happened there. Anyway, this was my house, and as has been said, these documents have been combined into these detailed plans, and that's a, 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 set, a, a detail from plan number 77. And that's my house here, that 35, that one there. And Carmel mentioned that the, those surveyors' notebooks aren't to scale, so they can be slightly different and the relationship with side boundaries can be slightly different. But they've measured it all so that when they draw these detailed plans, that's an accurate representation of the measurements that were taken. There is a time lag between them. The surveyors' notebooks here were 1923 and the, the detailed plan wasn't drawn until 18 months or so later. Um, Anyway, when, when I came to work here in particular, I didn't come to work here, but I got the John Oxley Library Fellowship to embark on that producing a second volume of, in our biographical dictionary. I produced the first one in 1994 with my wife, Judith Mackay, and I'm now working on one from 1900 to 1950. And so at odd times I had to explain how did I get into this because knowing how to date, having that idea about how to date house got me the job at the National Trust and gave me an interest in local history that I never had as a student of architecture at the University of Queensland. I, a, there wasn't much local history taught anyway and, and the European stuff didn't seem relevant to me. So I didn't have a great interest in history at all until I bought the house and then started looking at, uh, into its history. But then when I came here, I had to give explanations of this and whenever I gave these talks, I knew damn well that really what I'd decided was the history was wrong. And, um, and I just never faced up to looking at it all again to reconsider what, the, what I um, decided. So I need to look at a slightly larger, a larger context for it. The land was originally taken up by T.B. Stevens, who, who took up a lot of land here and in other parts of Brisbane. This is portion 144 here and 147 there. And I need to look at a few places. One, not, uh, the, our neighbour to the east which is this sub-88 of lot 144, it's number 31 Stevens Road. We're 39 Stevens Road there. And I also need to look at the one opposite, which is number 50 Brook Street, those three properties. Stevens Road um, was originally the driveway to the first Kambukwapa, T.B. Stevens' original house, which was where the railway line now runs through. And it was when the railway line came through in, the, in 1890, uh, Kambukwa was knocked over the original one and rebuilt on this site here. And that's now the, that fantastic house in the middle of Somerville House. Um, what you've got to remember looking at Brisbane in general sense is that we're part of a sort of flat earth society. We're busily flattening everything, <laughs> flattening it. We're filling in all the swamps and knocking the top off hills. And that, that happened here. So that although the driveway, create, the driveway of Kambukwa started Stephen, Stephen's Road, which is this road here, it really initially only came just there. These, these east-west streets were built earlier than the, the north-south street, if you like. The Brook Street of Brook Street was a, a brook that ran in the backyards of the house opposite, opposite us. And it ran across here and through Wool and Gabba Water Reserve and eventually is a tributary of, um, of Norman Creek. Um, Stevens Road itself wasn't put through till much later. This part up on the hill was part of a thing called Bewley Terrace, Bewley Estate, and I don't know whether the library has a map about that, but it's very not very interesting layout, uh, symmetrical, that you can see a triangular um, basis that's disrupted now by the railway line. But anyway, the bottom part of the, the, the hill is much more recent. These houses are all early 20th century. And as you can see here on McKellar's map, there's nothing on the eastern side of the road, although in my time that had houses right along. It's now a gymnasium of some of all. But um, anyway, we need to look at that, that slightly bigger context. Um, this is that detailed plan which I've already seen. You see the house opposite is three um, little terrace houses, single-fronted terraces. 
uh, and a duplex further up. That's right. Um, um, and I, I'm going to get lose my, my track. The important thing maybe to, to, to say before we move on. Oh, oh no, so I must be in the next slide. Um, um, our house is is and is a, is a kind of like a, a Georgian or Regency early Victorian um, two story cottage. <laughs> Um, and this isn't it, um, but it's like that, three windows upstairs, a, cent a, a central front door, windows to both sides. And so it's, it's an identical form, if a more modest version of this house. And what's interesting about the siding of it, as you might, uh, can see here, um, is that the side of it, this is the, the main facade was the eastern facade, and it faces now into the side of the neighbour's house. But this say, and this is put, surveyed in 23, drawn in 24, but the front steps are still shown there, although this house, and I've now dated it more recently, it was built in 1903, so that the front door was blocked off by a neighbouring property. But the thing that's um, important to that was you thought, well, what, what could the house must have been earlier than the, the orientation of Stevens Road. Like, nobody in their right mind would put their front door right onto the neighbour's property. And so that then related to this survey here, one of the surveys from Kay. And the date of that survey is February 1866. And you can see here that they've drawn on the survey what was obviously the orig originally intended alignment of Stevens, of Stevens Road to go straight south in which case the house would have had a, rela a relationship with the footpath identical to that house. It was a, norm a commonplace relationship for houses of this kind. So that the house now, it must be earlier than 1866. Um, um, so if you look then, say, this is the, um, this is the deed of grant, or the land purchase of T.B. Stevens in, in 1856. And uh, he... Um, he, he bought both allotments, suburban, eastern, uh, eastern suburban allotment, 144 and 147 on the same day. Um, but then subsequently he cut off 144, the land occupied by his own residence, and a new title was issued after the Torrance title came in that covered the balance of that land. And that's his title, and that's a picture of T.B. Stevens' own house. He was a, a um, hmm, gee, I'm going to forget this. A nephew of T, uh, Thomas Blackett, um, um, the the, uh, the the eminent um, Sydney architect, who was doing work up here for the Church of England, the church in the Anglican Church in North Quay, and one in Ipswich. So it's tempting to think he might have designed this house for them. Stevens Road is running. It, it faced Stevens Road, and the driveway went up and then turned into it like that. But then. Quite soon after he gets a new title issued under the Torrance system, he starts selling off the land. This is the first sale in June 63. And like some of those multiple pages, there are lots of pages in this subdivision. And they are enormously useful, I might say. It, hasn't, it wasn't quite said. But what these show is neighbouring properties. And if you're using post office directories, it's altogether more useful to look at more than the one property you're looking at. If you start having an idea about the ownership in sequence, um, that can be very helpful interpreting when it goes back before numbered blocks, num uh, street numbered blocks. And so um, these big, big subdivisions that trigger a lot of the early development can be useful in that regard. So I, I always like getting these, although they're quite, de quite complicated to look through. Um, but anyway, there, there are a couple of sales on this, and this is the one that's of most interest. This is my, pro my block, sub 67. And it was sold to Antonio Silvestri. And, and somebody asked Kay just after the last session, do you record the date of re production of the title or the registration? And no this person's more diligent and she records both dates. But I normally only record the date, the date of the first date because I'm primarily interested in the action to acquire it. I don't really care about the bureaucratic process to register it. Um, you know, it mostly happens automatically at a, with a reasonable in in interval of time. But what's so interesting here is that it's a four-year interval between the date it was produced and the date in which the title was registered. And that's explained by Antonio Silvestri being an Italian and, and, and he wasn't a naturalised British subject and they weren't allowed to own land. And not until he was naturalised could the, the title go through. So that, anyway, in the, the still the most interesting date is this first date here. But later on there's another date, another property, and it's the house across the road from us. And... Um, the Leos buy that land in 1865. And that's that house, um, the, um, it's this group of um, ter little terraces. Um, 
and yeah, okay. Um, so, what's the explanation for all of this? And I th I now, now think that that what what happened with my house is that it was built between Le uh, and uh, Sylvester acquiring the land in 1863. And the Leos buying the land opposite. I think the, the Leos arrived in Brisbane only a couple of days after Silvestri bought the piece of land. Um, and I think they were looking for work. He, the, uh, James Leo was a qualified stonemason, so he had building skills and things. I think they had no capital. So he and Joseph went to work and assisted Antonio Silvestri to make the blocks and to build my house. Um, uh, uh, and... I think when I spoke to Ivy Jones, there were no dates talked about. Ivy, Ivy Jones was born in 1895 and she remembered her memory of my house was collecting rent. It was mostly rented for, for most of its time. And she remembered collecting the rent. Well, she must have been, it must have been 19, two, three, four, five people did things younger then than they do now. You know, like a young child would be sent to collect the rent with nobody fearful of what might happen. But so that I think um, her memory dates from, say, 20 years after the date I thought the house had been built. So it was already some time in the distant past and she just knew that her uncle and, and father had, had built the house. So I think it's still compatible with that story that they still did build it, but they built it when they were working for Antonio Silvestri. By the time the house is approaching completion in, 18, in 1865, the Leos are looking for what do we do next? And that's when they bought the land opposite. They said, well, let's buy a side and build a house for, our, for ourselves. Let's develop the property over the road. So they move over the road and they go into a building speculation there, which fails for them. So that in 1867, in newspaper sources, you can find that the properties were sold at his risk by the mortgagee. And so they, had to, they, they didn't sell, and shortly after it was put up for sale, the Agra and Masterman Bank failed and Queensland Government was in dire straits. So the, the, there was a complete re sudden recession. Then it was sold uh, again, uh, offered for sale again, but by then the Leos had moved up to Gympie and didn't come back to Bris uh, Brisbane until the 1870s. Um, there's a, just, I'm getting close to finish, so you're nearly going to be let out. You just keep going. Um, um, there's some, it's just a final little part to this story, um, which is kind of intriguing. On the day that um, um, Silvestri bought um, my property in September 1863, he bought another piece of land. And recently I've looked at things that haven't come up today. And the, you can look at the index to the registers of conveyancing and encumbrances out of the state archives and then there are journals of, of these dealings and it's reasonably time consuming but I was interested in this case like did Silvestri own any other land? Um, from the naturalisation papers I knew he was born in Italy in 1830 in Venice but we didn't know too much more. There's a sale maker in Brisbane um, of um, uh, just preceding his ownership and it, and he, there's a, a licence for a timber getter up at Claremont. Again, in the recession, he moved up to the Copperfields. But I, we can't find more, more information on him. But these books are a check to what extent people had land. And the same for the Leos. The Leos owned no land until they bought that house opposite me, that land. So you can see they've arrived without capital. And then they, they work for eight, 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 two years or so for Sylvester and then have enough money to buy a bit of land of their own. But anyway, on the same day that Sylvester bought... Um, um, 539 Brook Street, he also buys a piece of land at, um, at Bulimba and this is the, the uh, land purchase um, for, that, for that property and that if any of you go to the National Archives, the National Archives is on this sub, sub 92 of, um, what is it, oh, I forget, parish of, of Bulimba. That, that's, where, that's roughly where it was located, but it's at the back of that behind the railway line. The railway line you might know crosses behind there and it's in the lowland in the hollow there and um, Anyway, he buys it on exactly the same day. It's two minutes after. One of the funny things about these register, they list the time of the purchase down to the minute. And so he buys one bit and then two minutes later he buys the next. So that they're bound together um, in some way that I didn't quite understand. It was, the land was owned by the manager, the Brisbane manager of the Bank of New South Wales, Shepherd Smith. And he does get a survey of the land done, which is this drawing on the right. And the piece of land I, I was interested in was this bit here, right in the low middle part of that site. Um, that's the locality plan. This is Wynnum Road here, the railway line, um, Lytton Road there. The National Archives is around here somewhere. Um, but, but although the survey was done, no development occurred on this site. No other bit of land was sold till 1980, a long time later. And when he sold it till Sylvester, he bought the land at 
two pounds, um, am I going to get this right? A pound an acre, sorry. He, he bought all the land at a pound an acre. And then he sold two and a quarter, uh, two and two and three quarter acres to Silvestri for two pounds 15, an identical price to the price he'd paid. Although by that time he'd had a survey done and thing. So, I mean, that's a curious bit of land dealing also. But anyway, my interpretation of all of this is that, um, is that and people in the past have always assumed that when earth buildings are built, that they just dig the, the, dig the earth next to the house or near the house. And you've got to think, would T.B. Stevens let someone just start digging up adjacent property, let's say the neighbouring property, when he's busily trying to flog them as a suburban estate? And so that does seem unlikely to me now, although in the past I'd have always thought, oh, they dug it up, but never really thought, well, there's no particular hollow on our site where they might have dug it. There's no evidence of any digging happening, happening on our site. And I now think he bought it, and the land's not very suitable anyway where we are. It's all schist. And things. So I wouldn't have made very good blocks in any case. But I think Silvestri could see that it wasn't a good place to, to make blocks and instead bought this piece of land down at Bulimba, which was absolutely eminently suited for, for cutting earth and making blocks. And the blocks were taken from Bulimba then up uh, either by B Bullock Cart up Lytton Road or taken to the river and taken up by boat. And I mean, I never would have guessed that, never thought that possible, but I'm, I'm pretty convinced now that that's the story. Um, certainly when Silvestri disposes of both my house and the piece of land at Bulimba, it's both to the same person within a few weeks of each other. So the two properties are definitely bound together. Um, anyway, that's my life in dating. <laughs> um, and I've got lots of help. I mean, I mean, at one stage it crossed my mind, God, this is so complicated, some of you will be put off. But you can start dirty, like I say, and the stuff I do is mostly at the beginning, at the forefront of this dating rather than the really detailed house history. I don't really do house history. So... So uh, it, it's been hugely rewarding for me um, to the accident of having bought this house. So anyway, thanks very much. Thank